Now, <laughs> Wednesday's announcement that Cheddar Man, a Mesolithic hunter-gatherer who lived here 10,000 years ago, was dark-skinned with blue eyes turned upside down many people's ideas about early Britons. Pale skin and fair hair didn't appear in Europe until after the arrival of farming, around 3,000 years later than Cheddar Man. Now, no-one knows how the dark-skinned and fair-skinned Britons viewed each other then, or even if they would have met, but today, we do know that the colour of a person's skin does affect their chances in life. A recent survey by Nat Sen for the Runnymede Trust found that 26% of the sample admitted to being racially prejudiced, 18% thought that some races or ethnic groups are born with less intelligence, and 44% found that uh, some races thought that some races are naturally harder working than others. But while people of colour are more likely to end up in prison, white working class boys are still at the bottom of the heap educationally. And as Beyonce's dad remarked this week, it's easier for those black female artists with lighter skin to become a success than it is for their darker sisters. Is Britain still racist? After you've written this fascinating book, Brit-ish, <laughs> <laughs> which has uh, caused a lot of stir and a lot of very, very interesting debate and conversation. Uh, but here's the question which you have to be asked, right? Um, middle class girl, private school, successful journalist, how has racism held you back? So I was really glad you read the facts you did in your intro because I feel like it's freed me from the need to prove that racism exists in society because whatever statistics you want to take, the ones that you mentioned, um, a quarter of people in the workforce who have ethnic minority heritage have been discriminated against or bullied by a manager in the last five years racially. Half of black African households live in poverty. Twice the number of young people from ethnic minority backgrounds are unemployed compared to their white counterparts. You know, the list is endless. I have written this book because I've had a very privileged life. I'm not a victim. I have had so many opportunities. And everywhere I've gone in society, whether it's the media, the bar, working in development, I have seen structural unfairness against people of colour everywhere I have looked. And I feel that it's a, the... it's a responsibility yeah. for me to use my platform to speak about these things. Because if I don't, and other people who have... This is a class-based society. So if you, ha you need to have privilege mm -hmm. like me in most cases to even be able to access platforms like this where we're sitting right now. So I'm speaking about what I see affecting all of us, whatever our race, because we all live in this structural and race, racialized How society. much is it race? What about the success of the East African Asians and the Chinese? So one of the things that I'm calling for with my book is a much more sophisticated discussion of race. You know, terms like BAME... So what about that question? Well, we are not all the same, you know. BAME people are not one monolithic group. If you look at um, people of South Asian heritage in the NHS, they're overrepresented at consultant level. If you look at black men from an Afro-Caribbean perspective, they are the mm. most likely to be unemployed and discriminated against in the workforce. So there are, there are, it's important to differentiate these experiences. And at the moment, I'm, I'm sorry to say, we have this very simplistic approach where we say um, white working class boys are not doing well in schools in coastal and rural areas. That that means we have overcome racism and now the only kind of prejudice in society is class-based. Is anyone These saying that we've overcome see, racism This when is they a conversation I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I have to have all Well, that, I thought that the was time. the kind of nuance that you were looking for. It is the kind of nuance that I'm looking for. And, you know, the thing is, well, I have not experienced what my, a generation above me experienced, of being yeah. chased down the street by people with baseball bats and called offensive racial slur words. That's not been my reality. That doesn't That's mean gone, that race. It? I think it hasn't gone. And if you look at, especially since Brexit, there has been a, a spike in uh, overt acts of racism. But that has not been my experience. My experience is about a much more insidious and therefore hard to right. articulate Let's racism that. that remains pervasive, which is based on 400 years of history, which doesn't disappear overnight. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Swara Singh. Oh, my God, so much to go on here. <laughs> <laughs> so little time. 400 years of history. What do you think about this? Well, some people say this is a kind of... Uh, there's a form of identity politics sure. here. My grievance is bigger than your grievance. My inferiority is bigger than your inferiority. That's what some people are saying sure. about this. Sure. Um, is it... What's your interpretation of that? It's a bit simplistic? It is. I, I've been here 28 years. The third day that I was in Britain, I was assaulted by three white young men who thought I was an Iraqi. Uh, since then, I've seen structural and individual racism, and I've also seen the enormous progress Britain has made in those 28 years. Now, I could either judge Britain by the handful of bad experiences I've had or the millions of ordinary, everyday um, interactions with ordinary, everyday white British citizens. Uh, the, uh, the question is, Britain racist? What, as compared to what? As compared to an utopian 
mythical society where nothing bad ever happens to anyone, Britain is probably racist. As compared to hum human societies as they've existed or as they exist now, Britain is one of the fairest and most tolerant societies. That does not mean that racism does not exist. Racism certainly exists and racist people certainly exist, but you cannot judge a society whole scale and you cannot use group differences and give a simplistic answer. If two groups differ, it must be because of race. There are multiple other, other factors involved. And the question of identity politics, I think it's the pseudo-politics of narcissism and pseudo-politics of self-centered... pseudo-politics self of narcissism. That's that's identity that's politics. Kahinda? I mean, that's ironic. I saw you shoveling in your no, chair. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's ironic to say it's a narcissistic individualist politics when your whole answer was, I have experienced and had some good experiences in Britain, right? And actually, if you're looking at racism, you have to look at the collective. You have to look at... And you can't find any statistic that doesn't have racial bias in it, not one. And we, I could go for like an hour and tell you all of them, all of them. And this does tell us something when we're having a debate that says, is Britain racist? Well, of course it is. And you want to have these comp comp comparisons to other countries, and that's not the point. The point is that racism is in the DNA of this country. It is well, based on the... No, listen, let me finish. Let me explain this. Let me explain. No, no, let me explain. 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 Well, that's quite a phrase. No, let me explain. I'll come back to you. We've got the time. I've got the inclination. You've got the points. Look at all the guests. Racism, Tony Sewell, is in the DNA of this country. Well, the Cheddar Man is in the DNA of this country, which is interesting. But I think that one of the points that someone made, which we've got to look at, is the, is the notion of progress. I mean, I grew up at the same era where Cyril Regis, the same generation, where we experienced day and night the racism was coming at us, day and night. I run a charity called Generating Genius, which is day and night producing probably at the moment, uh, uh, in, in terms of statistics, you talk about numbers here, probably more black girls now going into higher education getting the top results and probably going to be outstripping um, uh, and be on, on, on comparison with other groups so the, 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 the highest level. So what was, what, 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 what's happening here? Well, I think you're in danger with a kind of discourse that says um, that Britain is racist, therefore we can't. You'll just, you'll just make the lives of those children just a sense that we can't, we can't progress. It takes away the agency. real power of agency. Yeah. The word out of my mouth. Agency. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the drive. And we, you know where we are at the moment? This, in a couple of weeks, we celebrate the, um, the, the 70th anniversary of the Windrush generation. That was that group that came from uh, the Caribbean um, was asked to come over here. Massive resilience of those people that stood the, the racism, you know, and, and, and came out. And what was, what was characteristic of that generation was that, and I think if they were here now and speaking, they wouldn't recognise this notion that is Britain racist, and, and I agree with someone, they would see a massive improvement. And, until, and unless, unless, unless you're inside that, and unless you're dealing with that, you can't move on and you can't Progress. Do you agree with people who say there's a victimhood thing going on here? Absolutely. Or do you think that's patronising? Absolutely. And I think, I think, really? I, think the, I think the victimhood has become so incessant that it, it, it almost feels as if you... I, I fight day and night, really, with some of my young people to kind of come out of that mentality. It's almost like what you're thinking is holding you back. Mm. And that's, that, 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 that's really the framework. Ash, I will be with you, because uh, <laughs> Kahinda, I interrupted him on the DNA point. And uh, so p pick up, I'm sure you might want to not yeah. just pick up the points, but respond yeah. to no, Tony. I mean, I think this is, I mean, this when I say the DNA, that Britain's wealth is established on slavery, genocide and colonialism. It is. And you can, I can tell, we can have a whole session on that. And it's not just that. When we, why did we come in all these numbers? We came because they needed to build the nation, build social democracy, etc., etc., etc. That's what you call racial. We, they came, they came, they brought us in the country just to do that work. Is there and then while we're here, is there a and it's a point. This is a really important point. You have to understand. It's not victimhood to understand that you are racially oppressed if you are black in Britain today. But, but, that's not victimhood. Let me finish. Well. And let me, and let me explain. Well. No, no. What, who's I mean, doing I mean, what? I mean, I, 
black unemployment. Hang on a second. No, 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 no. Black youth male unemployment is is like crisis levels. You're talking forty percent black male youth unemployment in some parts of this country, and you're telling me they're doing well because you and me can sit here with good clothes on all We're doing well. We're not doing well. And let me other thing to point out about this. The other thing. The other thing to point out about this. The other point. Yeah, but but then they come out and they can't get jobs. And they come out and they can't get jobs. So you get all your qualifications. A lot of students can't get jobs. But there's no, no, no. There's another point. Two points. Really important. Actually, if you look at education, you look at graduates. Black graduates are significantly less likely to get jobs. The other thing about this is, we make an argument for resistance that is not victimhood. I'm not a victim. I'm not saying anybody's a victim. If I'm sitting We're talking in about now, politics and about movements. If I'm sitting in Sunderland now, that's, I would, that's I would, I would be looking at be. this okay. in Sunderland. In Sunderland, you could, I could be sitting in <coughs> Nosley in Liverpool. I'm picking up some areas. And the same argument will be running. It's not necessarily oh. that the oh, un- white people the, have been poor since before we were here, and they'll be poor if we were never here. That's Kahinda, the Kahinda, that's that's Kahinda, just but Ash, I will be with you. One here, like Tony. One second, <laughs> Tony. Ash, Kahinda. Sure, I'll be with you. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'd okay. be good in the classroom, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Kahinda. This film that you made, the psychosis of whiteness. Mm. Right. Now, some people might think that is a racist title. Mm. It's a provocative title. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> no, what if somebody made a film, <laughs> The Psychosis of Blackness? How would you feel no, about that? No, because the point about this... I actually did actually write a film about it. The point I stand corrected. About that. But the point of that is, is that... And this is that we've just presented all the evidence. There is no evidence that there's not racism in Britain, that things have really improved that much. There really isn't. And instead of saying, OK, let's look at this and understand it, we have this crazy, irrational discussion about, oh, I had this great experience, or, oh, we've got these graduates. And we can't... The whole point of this argument is that whiteness is actually not some rational thing you can debate with. For 400 years, we've been on the right side of the debate rationally, and nothing has changed. And what you'll find for the rest of this 40 minutes is we'll just talk around in circles, because we cannot come to account for the obvious big fat elephant in the room that says this country is racist. Even to reason, to gender, first of all, the country is racist.